Good morning. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We got a full house already. Welcome to Homestead Education Week. We're kicking it off. I'm gonna get my tripod set up here so you won't fall backwards. It is a freezing cold rainy day here in North Carolina. I don't know how, how it is where you are. You'll have to let me know. But it is currently 50 degrees in my greenhouse. I've got a little heater running. Um, and we are going to talk today about how to transplant seedlings. So if you're starting a garden this year and you've maybe done some seed starting, maybe you've got some little plant babies like I do, and you're thinking about how am I going to transition these from either grow lights or from a greenhouse out to the garden without killing them. That's what I'm gonna teach you today. So settle in, grab a notebook, and let's get started. Um, I'm going to pull up a seat too so we can chat. Now, as we go today, um, feel free to drop questions. If you look down here at the bottom of the screen, there's a little um, question mark towards the right side. If you will tap that question mark and put your questions there, I won't miss them when we get to the frequently asked questions at the end. And I'm also going to take time to help you guys troubleshoot if you have like specific issues going on with your seedlings. We'll do our best to help you work through those today. So before we talk about seedlings, let me just say thank you, thank you, thank you for being part of Homestead Education Week. Um, this week started as a, an idea, a way to kind of give back to this community that has given so much to my family. And we wanted to provide some sort of homestead conference for completely free that you could attend from home in your PJs if you need to. Um, a lot of us are busy people. We work, we have kids, and it's hard. Um, so that's what Homestead Education Week is about. All the workshops are free. This is the first one. There are 24 more workshops happening over the next nine days. And they're gonna be taught by a variety of amazing people. Um, I've recruited some of my best friends in real life to do some workshops as well. So I'm really excited for you to meet some of my friends and start to learn more about this homestead life that we all love and are drawn to, right? All right, so um, along with Homestead Education Week, we are also launching our new garden course from Grace Walk Farm. And I'm not gonna talk a whole lot about that right now. We're gonna get more into it later this week, but I do wanna want to mention it to you because our course is normally going to be priced at $250. Um, it includes video lessons. It's a 267 page book. There's printable seed starting logs, lots of printables in there. Um, so it's a great kind of surround you with garden help course. It, it's start to finish for very beginners. Um, Josh was a huge part of filming it, and we're excited for you to see it today. Several of you have already purchased it, and by several, I mean more than a few. <laughs> um, we woke up to the phone dinging with orders coming in, and we're just so excited. So, if you're interested in that course, you can check it out at the link in my bio. It's part of the new Homestead Bundle, um, and now's your chance to get it. It's only around for 10 days. So, today's day one. Go check it out. See what you think. All right, let's talk about seedlings. So my seed starting method is evolving, okay? Um, last year was the first year that I used LED grow lights and I set them up in my house and I put my little seedlings under them um, until it was warm enough to move outside. Because here in North Carolina, even though I have a greenhouse, I don't know if y'all can see, like I can see my breath, like it's cold in here. Um, so even with a greenhouse, we really have to keep it heated for seedlings. Um, so what I've kind of transitioned to this year, I started out under grow lights, but because our garden is growing so quickly, I don't have enough room under my grow lights for all the seedlings I needed to start. So we started heating our greenhouse with a little propane heater, and that seems to be making a pretty big difference. Um, and it's working well for us. So another option for seed starting is winter sowing. And there is a wonderful account you can follow to learn about that. Um, Sarah on a farm is her account name. And she teaches you how you can sow your seeds in jugs and leave them outside actually. And they won't get frost damaged with the method she teaches. So I wanna play around with that in future years. 
but as of right now we're here March 22nd and I have 100% of my seedlings here in the greenhouse so I'm gonna give you a look don't judge my mess y'all it's seed starting season okay I've got lots of plant babies everywhere in here and lots going so when you start your things from seed like this number one you can save a ton of money doing it that way right seeds are way cheaper than buying plants if i go to the store and i buy a little plant like this at lowe's four dollars some are five if i buy a pack of seeds i can get 100 seeds that will produce 100 plants for about three to three to four dollars depending where you get them so it definitely pays you can get like a hundred plants for the price of one plant if you start your own from seed but the the key here is you've got to be able to move them from these little cups in your garden without them dying and that's where things can get tricky for a lot of people um, i've lost plenty of plants since i've been gardening with that very thing where i have a cute little plant baby and it looks big enough and i'm like all right let's put it outside and then suddenly it wilts it dies something happens and that's what we want to avoid so I'm gonna give you three steps three key things if you're a note taker that you need to remember about transplanting seedlings today and these three principles will really guide you through the process and then I'm going to actually talk you through how to plant a seedling my original plan was to take you out to my garden and actually plant something with you but since it's pouring the rain, I think we'll stay in the greenhouse instead, okay? So, all right, three principles for successfully transplanting seedlings. Here we go. Number one, you need to start with strong seedlings. So I know that sounds like common sense, but what that really comes down to is how big is your seedling? So take this guy, for instance. This is some Greek moulin. Um, it's actually two little plants in here. These are pretty good size to go out in the garden, okay? They're established. This plant is about six weeks old. But on the flip side of that, let me show you another one. I've got some St. John's wort here. If you can't tell, I'm growing a lot of herbs and medicinals this year. But you see how little that is? That is in no way, shape, or form ready to go in the garden. So you want your plants to be, I mean, probably four to six inches tall before you even think about transplanting them. They've got to be strong. If you think of seed starting and planting seeds kind of like you're raising a baby, okay? So you put your seed in, your little plant emerges, it germinates, it's born. When it's first born, it's weak and it's tender and it needs a lot of tender care. Um, you have to be very gentle with baby seedlings. Just like we have to be with baby humans. We can't just stick a baby human out in the world and say good luck to you, right? We gotta nurture, we've gotta bring them in and teach them how to human. So, um, oh okay, somebody said they can't see from the comments. I believe, well, I was gonna say you might can uh, swipe to the left and they may go away, but that's not working for me currently. So, I'll hold things higher so you can see. Sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> so, Anyway, you've got to start with strong seedlings. So you almost want to think of this like you don't want to put a plant into your garden until it's a teenager slash young adult. It needs to have some maturity about it. Um, it needs to be able to take up the nutrients it needs from roots. So they've got to be pretty well developed. It's got to have enough leaves to take the energy it needs from the sun so that has to be pretty well developed as well, right? And it takes time to get there. So if you are thinking, I'm going to go start my seeds this week, and then in about two weeks, I'll put them out in the garden, you're going to fail. And I hate to say that, but that's just the honest truth of the matter. It is going to take time for your seedlings to develop. And you've got to get them strong and hardy and ready to go in the garden. All right, so number one is start with strong seedlings. Number two is hardening off is critical. Critical, critical, critical. So what are we talking about with hardening off? So hardening off seedlings, it's a term you're gonna hear with gardeners a lot, but 
basically all it means is you're gonna take your seedlings, not this one, because it's too little. Let me get another one. You're gonna take your little seedling and you are going to let this spend some time outside. Even if it's been in a greenhouse, even if it's been covered in a cold frame of some kind, it still needs to spend some time outside to just get used to the environment. Um, because there's lots of elements that this little plant will experience once it's in the garden that it's not experienced yet in the greenhouse. For instance, wind. Spring wind is a big thing. Um, here in North Carolina, we tend to have very, very windy March and April. And so I'm very aware of that when I put a little seedling in the ground, is the wind gonna come and just snap that stem? If it's too small and tender, I hold off. I don't put it in yet. Um, so here's how you harden off your seedlings. It's a process, it takes about two weeks to do it right. What you're gonna do is you are going to put your little seedlings in a tray or something like this, okay? And um, let me grab a couple, here's a loofah. Okay, so you're gonna get your seedlings and you're gonna put them in a little tray and you're going to sit them outside in your garden near the space where you intend to plant them in the very exact environment you want this plant to adjust to. And you are going to sit these outside for one hour and you wanna do it in the evening or late afternoon when it's not the hottest part of the day when the, the direct sun is not overhead. You wanna ease them in. So kind of four o'clock in the evening is usually my time when I will start hardening off things. So the first day you're gonna take them out and maybe they'll spend an hour outside, okay? And you're gonna keep an eye on them. You're not gonna sit them outside and then go in and start scrolling Instagram or, you know, whatever, watching Netflix. Don't get distracted. You've got to watch them because those tender seedlings while they're hardening off are going to be your, your roadmap. You've got to see how they're responding to the environment. If you see them start to wilt, if you see them start to kind of droop, if you see them, um, hopefully you don't see this, but if you just see them completely fall over and turn brown, that doesn't usually happen that quick. But anything that changes that would show that your plant is, is experiencing some form of stress, you need to bring it back inside. And so I usually start with about an hour, and then the second day I'll do an hour and a half. The third day, I'll do two hours, and so on and so on and so on. And every day, I leave them outside just a tiny bit longer. And what we're doing is we're kind of like building up a tolerance to the environment around our plants. We are teaching them how to survive in the great big garden world. And we're getting them used to things like wind and rain and insects and birds and all the things that these little guys have never experienced yet. And we're gonna kinda ease them in to life in the garden. So you've gotta harden them off. Now, the bare minimum, the very bare minimum that I would say you need to harden off a plant properly is one week. Um, I prefer to do it over two weeks and really kinda stretch it out um, and go very easy. And by the time you're done hardening off, they should be outside all day and all night. You want them to spend a couple nights outside just to make sure they're they're ready before you plant them. So that's how you harden them off. So let's do a quick recap for those who are just joining in. We're talking about the three principles that you need to know for transplanting seedlings. Number one was start with strong seedlings. You don't want itty bitty puny plants going in your garden. They need to be strong and established. Number two was hardening off is critical. You have to get your baby plants used to the great big garden world before you put them out there to survive. And here's number three, timing is everything. This is true with all things gardening, but it is especially true when it comes to seed starting and transplanting seedlings and just starting a garden in general. If you do everything right, let's say that you have been a master gardener this spring. You started your seeds, you have watered them regularly, they are healthy, they're beautiful, they're ready, and then you put them in the garden and um, it all just kind of falls apart. Chances are you either didn't harden them off properly or you have planted them at the wrong time. 
and timing is different in every location. That's what makes this so difficult. A lot of times I get messages and people say, when do I plant cucumbers or when do I plant tomatoes? And I can't give you a firm answer because it really depends where you live. But what I can tell you is there are some ways you can figure this out. So the first thing you need to know is when is your average last frost of the season? The last date when typically you would have a freeze overnight where you live. For us here in North Carolina, it's, it's typically April 15th. Um, they have kind of moved it up this year um, and said now it's like April, I think it was second last time I looked. I am still not planting anything frost tender in my garden until probably the end of April or early May. Um, you just never know. And the thing with frost is when you have a garden, if you have plants that can't withstand a freeze, which most plants can't, there's a few that can, but most cannot, if you have them out there, they're gonna die and you've lost all that work. And y'all, there is nothing, like it just makes my stomach drop to even talk about it. There is nothing, you know, that we can, um, do to to change that you know um let's see okay sorry um so we got to make sure we do this the right way when we transplant them and you got to nail the timing so for here in north carolina just to give you an idea what i figured out is there's almost three garden seasons and i think it's sort of like this in a lot of the united states unless you live somewhere like california or florida or texas where it's just warm all the time <laughs> Um, here in North Carolina, we really have four true seasons, and I've discovered that there is spring gardening, which is what we plant that can withstand frost, things that can get cold, can get below freezing, and survive. So for us, um, that looks like cabbage, broccoli, kale, um, any kind of brassica, that's a family of plants, Brussels sprouts, um, Lettuce can do okay as long as it doesn't get like below 25 uh, Fahrenheit. If it drops below that, your lettuce won't do well. Um, some herbs do really well in cool weather. Peas can do really well in cool weather. Cilantro, if you want cilantro for your salsa, you can grow that in cool weather. But you definitely do not want to plant things like tomatoes and peppers and squash and cucumbers. And those like traditional vegetables that we think of with gardening, those cannot and should not go in the ground until after your last frost date. Uh, somebody said they wait till May or, or after Easter, and I think that's wise. Um, I've heard a lot of old farmers say they wait till Mother's Day. I never am patient enough to wait till Mother's Day. <laughs> By the beginning of May, I'm like, let's do this thing. I've been starting these plants since January. I'm ready to get them in the garden. Um, but I do try to wait. And it makes a big difference because you, you kind of set yourself up to fail if you put them in too soon. Now, if you're struggling to figure out like what is your frost date, what is uh, the best time to start your seeds, all of that, um, there is a trick. And it's for people in the United States. So if you're not in the US, I don't know that this will be helpful for you, but I still wanted to mention it. Um, if you go to the website, almanac.com, A-L-M-A-N-A-C.com, it's the Farmer's Almanac website. If you scroll down, on the left side, there's a button that says something like custom planting dates or get my planting dates, something like that. Click that, and you can put in your zip code, and when you put it in, it will generate for you a list, and it will tell you what month to start your seed, what month to transplant it, and it will give you complete guidance um, of everything you need to know, basically, to nail the timing of your garden. So for me, that was a game changer. Instead of guessing, and like I used to uh, watch YouTube gardeners, and I would just kind of like, I found a few that were in my state, and I would watch, and I would be like, okay, she's planting potatoes, so it's time for me to plant potatoes. Okay, he's planting squash, so I need to plant my squash. And that's fine. Like, I know a lot of people in North Carolina um, watch and do that with what I'm planting, and I, that's fine, I don't mind. But you need to learn this stuff so that if at some point you can't watch, you still know how to plant your garden, if you get what I'm saying. So we need to, to be prepared for that. Um, so download those dates, you can print them out. 
If you don't want to fool with it, um, we have an option at gracewalkfarm.org where you can order custom planting dates. And basically we take those dates from the almanac and we organize them into like a beautiful, pay, uh, it's not a spreadsheet, but it's like a beautiful document that breaks it down for every month what to plant. And if that's something you're interested in, you can grab that at gracewalkfarm.org. Um, but you can find all that information free, free for yourself. So I'm totally not trying to sell you on that necessarily. And honestly, it takes me a long time to make those. So I hesitate to even mention them. But if you're really, really stuck and you need one, we can help you out. So nail that timing. Timing is so critical for all things gardening. Um, Kiara said the Farmer's Almanac has been a great resource for me as a beginner gardener. Me too. I actually like joined their subscription program. I love the Farmer's Almanac. I refer to it very, very often. Uh, my Paw Paw was a farmer and um, I have some memories as a child of, of seeing him sit in his chair and read the Farmer's Almanac. So to me, that's all the credibility it needed. If it was good enough for my Paw Paw, it's good enough for me. <laughs> All right, so the three rules for transplanting, start with strong seedlings, hardening off is critical, timing is everything, and now let's talk about the nitty gritty of how you do this thing. How do you transplant them? So I'm gonna talk you through this, even though I, I can't do it in the garden. I'm gonna grab a tomato plant here. Okay, this is a Mrs. Maxwell's Big Italian Tomato. It's pretty, isn't it? So, Here's what we're gonna do. Let's pretend that it's the end of April and my little tomato plant here has spent some time outside, it's hardened off, it's ready. And one thing I'll mention is, I don't know if you guys can see the leaves when you have a plant like this that has been indoors, they are very thin. You see that? I mean, just paper thin. But when you harden them off, they're gonna get a little leathery and a little thicker and that's gonna help them withstand the elements. So that's normal. If you see a little bit of that, that is normal. Um, you don't want them to shrivel up, but they are going to, to show a little bit of signs of, of just kind of getting tougher skin, more or less, to withstand. So let's say we're ready to plant this. It's hardened off. Our timing is right. We know it's an okay time. There's no danger of frost. How do I plant my tomato? First thing we're gonna do is we're gonna prep the garden. And you can do this a couple of ways. Um, so if you just have one or two garden beds, the easiest thing to do is to prep them all at one time. This is what I do even with, I have 25 raised beds plus two large in-ground gardens. And we prep them all at one time before we start planting. And to prep, here's what we're doing. We're adding at least three to four inches of fresh compost to add new nutrition into the soil to feed our plants. Um, we are also, we don't till, but what I like to do is when we put that compost in, um, I like to just kind of go in with a rake and loosen my soil up a little bit. Um, just to kind of make sure that it's not tight packed and the roots can really grow and get down in the soil and get to the nutrients. You've got to loosen it up just a little bit. Um, we don't till, don't plow. I don't, I'm not a fan of either. I think both are largely unnecessary. If you learn to make compost and you make enough, you can just amend your beds by adding stuff on top and you won't disturb that whole um, ecosystem really that's alive underneath the top layer of your soil. Every time you, you dig that or you plow that or you till that, you're really doing damage to the soil, plain and simple. So. If you're interested in learning more about no-dig gardening, that's a whole other topic, but I would recommend that you look into Charles Dowding videos on YouTube. I, I love kind of jokingly say like 99% of what I know about gardening, I learned from Charles. <laughs> um, I call him my garden buddy because if I have a question, he's the one I would ask. He's amazing. Um, so anyway, we're gonna prep our garden. We've got our compost added. We're gonna take our little plant out there. Remember, it's hardened off and we're gonna dig a hole. Now, how big of a hole do you wanna dig? You see the size of your pot here? You wanna dig a hole that's twice as wide and not twice as deep, but maybe one and a half as deep, about, about to here. Now with tomatoes, you can go deeper because when I bury a tomato, I actually am gonna bury it to right here. 
that's the only from there up is the only part that is going to be showing above the soil because for tomatoes let me see if i can get in close so you guys can see this do you see all these little hairs on the stem here i don't know if you can see them look over here give me a heart if you can see what i'm talking about there those little hairs that's roots so tomato stems can root from any part of the stem, literally any part of the stem. So by planting it deep to right here, this whole part is going to put out roots to the side and they're going to grow deep. And what's going to happen is I'm going to end up with a really, really strong, hardy tomato plant. And um, it's going to produce better. I'm going to get a better harvest. It's going to withstand the elements better. Plant your tomatoes deep. Now you can't do that with everything, but with tomatoes you can. So for other plants, like let's say, let me grab a, something different here. I'll grab this little, well, here. I'll show you my favorite few. This is a good excuse to show off my plants. I love talking plant babies. So here's the favorite few. So let's say, how deep do we wanna plant this? I'm going to dig it to about here, a little deeper than my pot and twice as wide as my pot. And then what I'm gonna do is gently Kind of pinch it just enough to loosen it you see that and i don't know if you can tell but it's sort of lifting out and then you can gently kind of pour it into your hand and pull it out now i'm not going to take this out because i can't put it in the garden yet it's raining um but then you're going to put it down in your soil and the biggest thing you want to remember is not to damage the roots a lot of times when seedlings die from transplant, it's because we were we were not delicate enough with the root system. Those roots are the life of the plant. They cannot live without their roots. And so you have to take care of them. And so that's why I say dig a slightly bigger hole than you need so that you can just gently set the root ball down in there. And then you're gonna pull your, your soil together and kind of pack it around. And then I always like to do a little thing where I like pat the soil down right around whatever I've planted. And that just kind of firms it in and gives it a little more stability. And then after you plant, you wanna water. You wanna water pretty much immediately when you plant. Um, make sure there is uh, moisture ready and available. Um, some people will tell you it's best to water your seedlings right before you transplant them. I've read that in a lot of books, but I'm going to be honest with you. I think that's terrible advice <laughs> because if, if you water this, a seedling, the soil is going to be damp and it's going to be really hard to number one, get it out of the cup in one clump. It's going to be a mess. It's just don't do it. Instead, you know, water the day before or however you normally would, but the day you're gonna transplant, don't water them. Wait and water them after you've put them in the garden. Um, I think that makes a tremendous difference in how well your plants thrive. Um, so, after you've planted it, looking at my notes here, I don't wanna forget anything. You've planted it, you didn't disturb your roots. If it's a tomato plant, you planted it really deep. Um, you water deeply. The next thing you've gotta do is mulch it. I am a big fan of mulch in the garden. I think mulch can make a dramatic difference in how much you get to harvest because what it does, is it really does a couple things, but number one, it holds moisture in the soil. And in the summer, especially, that soil can dry out so, so fast. Um, and so by, you know, mulching it, it's gonna hold some of the moisture in. You may not have to water quite as often by doing that. Um, and it also is gonna help prevent the weeds from taking over. You know, um, the, the weeds are inevitable. Like you're going to have weeds. There is no magic solution to just ban weeds forever. But what you might find is some of the weeds that you're battling with are actually edible and medicinal. <laughs> so look them up, use a plant ID app before you just go ripping stuff out, you might find something amazing. I found several medicinal herbs growing on our property wild just by kind of using that little app while I'm weeding the garden. Um, but you, you've got to keep the weeds from choking out your little plants. And if you don't stay on top of them, the weeds will take over. So when it comes to weeds, my rule is 15 minutes every single day. And that can look however you want it to look. Turn on a podcast, listen to some music, bring your kids out and let them help. Um, maybe that's the time of day when you and your significant other 
just hang out and catch up on life. Like, work it into your daily routine. Um, that is the best way to stay on top of weeds and don't get behind because if you miss a day or two, when you come back, instead of 15 minutes, you're gonna to need to do an hour and 50 minutes or something crazy. So just stay on top of it. Um, okay, the app that I use to identify, I think it's just called Plant ID. There's several, I've tried a couple, but I think the one I use most is called Plant ID. It was free, didn't have to pay for it. So um, I think I searched like either foraging apps or plant identification apps, something like that in the app store and it came right up and it, it works well. You take a picture of whatever plant, it, that, what, blah, blah, I can't talk, whatever the plant is you're looking at, you take a picture and then you upload it and the app will actually match it to a photo directory and show you, you know, what it is. So, little tip. All right, so we've covered the basics of transplanting. I can't believe we got it all covered in 30 minutes. So let's do this, let's dive into questions. I've been seeing lots of them coming through. Um, so go ahead and drop any questions you have and we'll start going through them. Um, is it better to water in the morning or the evening? The books will tell you it is better to water in the morning. I will tell you I prefer to water in the evening. <laughs> so I think as long as you're not watering in the hottest part of the day, either way is okay. The reason that a lot of people say don't water in the evening is because you're gonna keep your soil damp overnight, which can kind of cause some mildew and fungal issues. So if that's something that you tend to deal with in your garden, don't water at night. But for me, um, just my schedule with homeschooling my kids and everything else going on, it's just not realistic, you know, to, um, plan to be out to water first thing every morning. I just, it won't happen. I know my routine. And so what I tend to do is come out after supper and while everybody's kind of doing their nighttime routine, finishing up for the day, I come out to the garden and water or come out to the greenhouse and water. And that works really well for me. Um, okay, let's see. Where do you get your 1020 trays from? I bought some in there flimsy. Okay, my friend, let me show you something. Hold on, I'm gonna have to get up for this. I'm gonna show you two options. Let's just raise you up. Okay. I've got two different kinds, and one is dramatically better than the other. So I wanna show you the difference. So I've got this one. These are from Amazon, okay? They were fairly inexpensive. Um, I like trays because I bought them water, so instead of pouring water onto my plants, I pour it into the tray, and they soak it up from the bottom because they've got holes in the bottom of the pots. So I got these on Amazon, but you can see, like, I mean, they're flimsy, and I've broken, I don't know, I've probably broken five or six already this garden season. So, I have a better option. Let me grab one. company sent me this so I'm gonna say that up front I sent me this to try it's um, all about the garden is the name of the they have a page on Instagram you can look them up and I can tag them in stories later if you need me to but this is their tray okay and they make this is the seedling tray and y'all it's so sturdy I mean it's thick thick plastic and then this is the underneath tray um, which I mean, it's like a lunch tray from elementary school. You remember those lunch trays? We used to go sledding on them when I was in college. <laughs> but that's what it reminds me of. I mean, it's very sturdy. So these are the ones I would recommend, the ones that I've had the best experience with so far. Um, so let me know if you need a link for those. I do feel like they have done better for me. Um, what type of mulch do we use? Well, we kind of have a couple of things we use. Um, wood chips is our number one. So I use wood chips to mulch the pathways in my garden. Um, I also use them to put a light layer over the top of my garden beds once all my plants have come up. If I'm planting things directly from seed, I don't add the mulch until they come up and they're big enough to kind of lay it in around them. If you do mulch with wood chips, be careful not to go too thick because it can sort of suck the nitrogen out of the soil. Um, 
you just want to go a light layer the other kind of mulch that i really love and josh and i kind of argue about this <laughs> because he hates it but i love it is straw i love straw it breaks down easily um i find that it gives the best coverage um if it was up to me i would mulch my whole garden with straw but Josh hates it, and he's like, no, it's put, it's bringing in grass. Now, you definitely, if you use hay, you'll get grass in your garden. But the beds I'm using straw in, we do get a little bit of grass, but it's like the real shallow, quick to grab out, so it's not a big deal. I love straw, but that's a judgment call. You can decide what you prefer. Um, you can also mulch with just natural things that you, that you can find. Like in the fall, we like to mulch with dried leaves. Um, we also like to use pine needles. We have a lot of white pines, or is it white pines or yellow pines? I don't remember. That grow all along the perimeter of our property. And they drop their needles in the fall. And I just let those fall all over my garden and it kind of creates a mulch layer too. And those work well. So you can really use any of that. Some people just mulch with compost. You can do that too. Um, okay, if you were using grow lights and it says 18 hours on, would you turn the lights off in the evening or during the day? I would turn them off at night. You want to kind of, as much as you can, you're, you're kind of trying to artificially create a summer environment for them to, to run into. Um, so, you know, like, I think most things say leave them on 18 hours. I usually do more like, a little less than that I guess we turn them on when we get up in the morning usually 6 30 7 o'clock and then we turn them off at night whoever goes to bed last turns them off it's usually Josh he's a night owl, and so he usually turns them off about midnight um, but as you know as they get a little bigger you can really just run them for more like 12 hours a day and they'll do just fine okay oops we said I can't add questions I'm sorry I don't know what's going on. It's not been a good tech morning here. I'll tell you something about that in a minute. Um, in the heat of summer, do you water more than once a day? Um, I have, but it would, it has to be like really, really hot, like upper nineties, high, I mean, just unrelenting direct sun. Like I go by how my soil feels. I don't keep to like a set schedule or I don't water like I have to water every other day or I have to water every three days. I don't do something like that. I literally just go dig down into the soil of a bed and I try to feel around where the roots of the plant would hit. So, you know, like for a plant like this, the roots are down here. So you don't want to just fill up here. You need to fill down to here to see if there's moisture in there. And then if it feels dry, go ahead and water. And if you're like, you like to nerd out about stuff like this and you like to get real technical, you can actually buy a moisture meter. And it's almost like a, like a meat thermometer is what it reminds me of. Um, and you stick it down in the soil and it will tell you whether or not you need to water or not. So if you're struggling with watering and not, if you're not sure if you're underwatering or overwatering, one of those little moisture meters might be well worth every penny. Uh, the bottom leaves of the tomato plants, do you cut them off or just bury them? I remove them. So, where'd my tomato plant go? Here it is. Okay, so I told you I'm gonna bury it to about here. So that means I'm gonna need to pinch off this one and this one. And it feels really scary because your plant seems big and now you're you're making it very small but it's so worth it it's it's very much worth it the result you'll get from your tomatoes by doing that i promise you're gonna message me later this summer and you're gonna be like amber i'm so glad so glad that i buried my tomatoes deep it really works <clears throat> okay um how do you know when a plant or seedling is ready to go from a seedling tray to a bigger pot until transplant that's a good question so there are some signs you can look for. I've got some that need to be transplanted up. Let me show you. So, okay, let me show you this guy. This is a beefsteak tomato plant. He's looking kind of wonky, you see? <laughs> that? 
And you see how my leaves are kind of, that one's starting to get a little yellowing and they're a little curled. Chances are we're root bound. This thing has probably um, really maxed out the amount of space it's got in this little pot. So it needs a bigger pot if it's gonna survive. And when I up pot this, when I put it in a bigger pot, I'm gonna bury it, just like I talked about. I'm gonna leave that much of it sticking out. And I've already done that once this year. This will be my second time. And once you kinda bury it to here, then let it develop one more time and fill up your cup and then it'll be ready to plant outside, if that makes sense. Honestly, this is plenty big enough size to go outside now. But my issue is I started my tomatoes in January, uh, middle of January, which was a little crazy, but we wanted to see if we could develop really good root systems by starting early. Um, so we'll see how it goes. I'll keep y'all posted on that experiment, but here we are. We've still got a month really before they can go out and they're looking like this. So they're, they're almost ready. All right. Um, I water my tomatoes every day. Is that too much? Um, it depends. It depends where you live. It depends how hot it is outside or wherever you have them. Um, just feel in the soil. Like you don't want them sitting in drenched soil all the time or the roots can rot. So you gotta really just kind of go by how it feels. What temperature is your greenhouse with the heater in it? Worried mine will be too cold, but I suppose I could add a heater. So it is currently 59.5 degrees in here. Um, and I've just got this running on low. Y'all wanna see the heater that I use? It's plugged in. So this is just a little space heater and you can find these that have a fire safety uh, feature where if they get knocked over, they automatically switch off. And that hooks to propane. So you can connect it to a little tank like this. What we actually did was we connected it to a big tank. Um, you just have to buy a hose to connect it. And a little tank like this will last you maybe I don't know, maybe 18 hours of running your heater. Um, I only run it at night. It's warm enough here during the day with the sun on the greenhouse that it stays plenty warm. But the um, at night, we need the heat. So a little propane heater works. Um, we don't have electricity in the greenhouse. If, I, if we did, I would run something with that. Someday, I really want to add some sort of solar powered something. We're just not there yet. Baby steps, right? Um, but that works really well to have the little heater out here. Um, let's see. Would love to see a tour of your greenhouse. Okay, y'all. Don't judge me because it's a mess. <laughs> I'll show you a little bit. All right, so I've got lots of stuff going on in here. I've got wreaths hung up everywhere where we took the dried grapevines and we've turned them into little wreaths. How fun is that? So those are drying. Um, let me switch you around here. Okay, so I've moved, I have so many tomato plants. I've moved them to sit on the ground. Um, so there's all the tomatoes. We have put a new bed in here. This is a Vigo garden bed. Um, I have several of those out in the garden too. I don't know if you can see them, but the Vigo bed here is not filled up yet. It's just been like my dumping ground for extra mulching compost this winter. And we're gonna finish filling it up shortly and I'll grow some stuff in here this winter. Um, but for now, it's just kind of holding stuff. <laughs> There's some more plant babies over there. Lots and lots of things growing in here. Um, lots of tomatoes. Um, I've got lots of flowers and herbs started. So there's kind of a quick <laughs> greenhouse tour. Um, speaking of greenhouses, do you guys have greenhouses? Like this was a dream come true for me. It seemed like an unachievable, unachievable dream um, because I would see people that had these beautiful little greenhouses and I just thought, you know, you look them up online, they're like twelve, thirteen thousand dollars $13,000. I was just, oh, that's crazy. We can't spend that kind of money. Um, so Josh designed this one with salvaged windows that he found on Facebook Marketplace and it worked out really well. But here's the thing. There is a plan for a seven by 10 greenhouse that is included in this new homestead bundle. 
um, and it gives you the, the exact materials list you need, the step-by-step -step directions about how to build it, and it would be way cheaper than buying a greenhouse, way cheaper. To give you an idea, our total investment in building this greenhouse was $1,500. So, and I'm pretty sure the, the plans for the one included, um, it's built with the panels like we have on the roof here. And with that, I think your expense would be even lower. So, FYI, if you're dreaming of a greenhouse, grab that bundle today um, and you can get it. Uh, cheapest way to get your soil when starting. I'm turning my backyard into a community garden. Oh my goodness, I love that. Okay, <clears throat> the cheapest thing when you're getting started, number one, is you need to, to network with farmers around you. Um, you need somebody that could, um, number one, provide you with enough manure to compost <laughs> if you don't have a lot of animals. Um, somebody that can give you like their old animal bedding to compost down. Um, talk to your farmers because they're gonna have the best guidance on that. Another thing I would suggest is to check with landscape companies near you. They always know the best tricks to find soil at the most inexpensive price and they'll probably be able to tell you whose soil is best in your area. So for me, um, we buy our compost. Actually, look at this. Out the door there, you can see our big compost pile. <laughs> we get compost, I say buy it, but we didn't buy it. Um, so we have a friend who has a mulch yard and we kind of just traded off some work. Um, so Josh went and did some painting work for him and in exchange, he gave us all the compost we needed for this year. So get creative, like you can barter. There's lots of ways you can trade. Trade the vegetables that you're gonna grow, like promise the vegetable delivery if you're confident you can deliver it. Um, and check with your uh, local county extension office as well. Um, it's different in every area, but I know here where I live, you can go get, uh, I think it's one free load of compost and one free load of mulch every so often from our city facilities. Obviously, you're gonna to wanna to ask what it's been sprayed with, what's in it, all that kind of stuff, but there are definitely ways to do it. And I love that you're using a community garden or that you're building a community garden. Um, okay, I love straw, but I recently read that if the straw has been raised using glyphosates, then it brings it into your organic garden. So to ask when you buy, I didn't know that last year. That's true. You do need to know what's been sprayed on that straw. That's very important. So know where you're getting it. Um, we buy it from a farm that buys a lot of it and we, we just buy a little bit from them. So you gotta know your source for all things gardening if you're trying to do organic and good for you for being organic. I'm trying to be too. Um, let's see. Favorite soil for starting your seedlings. This year I used something new. I used Daddy Pete's Plant Pleaser and it went really well. They've done best best year ever in terms of seed starting and germination. So I, I recommend Daddy Pete's. You can get it at like Lowe's and Home Depot here in North Carolina. I would assume you could in other places as well. Um, why are my pepper seedlings so spindly? My first guess is they're too young because pepper plants start out very spindly. But if, um, if they're getting tall and spindly, it's because they, they're probably not getting enough light. So you're gonna want to increase the amount of light they're getting somehow. Um, do you lay the tomato root stem sideways? Yes, 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 yes. So like when you plant it, almost like dig a trench instead of a deep hole almost kind of like, and then I lay it in. So it'll, it would be like this, if that makes sense. And it's gonna kind of lay sideways and just this is above the soil. But the, under the soil, it's gonna look like this. Does that help? Does that make sense? Sorry, I'll hold it up. You wanna lay it sideways like that. Um, you can go deep, but it's gonna have a harder time getting water to those bottom roots. Whereas if you lay it shallow like this, you know, it'll, it'll get to the moisture a little easier. Can you give any advice on basil? Mine is getting really tall and leggy. Should I treat it like a tomato plant and plant it deeply? Um, 
I don't think that you want to plant basil deeply. I've never tried it. Um, but I will say basil is really, really hard to start for, from seed for me. It takes a long time to germinate. Um, but once it gets going, I've found that it sort of fills out and bolts up. So my gut is to tell you it's probably gonna just be fine. Um, but if it continues to struggle, send me a picture and I'll try to help you figure it out. Um, let's see. My husband converted an old shed into a greenhouse. Oh, that's such a good idea. I've been collecting windows for a greenhouse. I'm telling y'all, this greenhouse has been like such a gift for me. It's, um, it's just like a little escape, you know, that I can come to. Um, grow light recommendations. I see a couple questions about that. I used, uh, the brand is Barina. I think B-A-R-R-I-N-A. -R -R -I, I think I'm spelling that right. They're from Amazon. I believe I have a link for them somewhere. So if you need a link, just message me. I'm going to be checking my messages more frequently than usual this, this week with it being Homestead Education Week. So if you need links for anything specific, I'm happy to share with you what I use. Um, I don't have any sort of like affiliation or sponsorship or anything like that with, with these supplies at this point. Like I'm just telling you what I enjoy and use. So I'll say that up front. Um, but I'm happy to share links if they're helpful for you guys. Oh, Hillary said, I feel like pruning is the key with basil. That's very true because when you cut that little top part of your basil off, it'll bush out and it'll get full. Good thinking, Hillary. Thank you for, for saying that. That's true. Okay, let's see. I'm going to check one last time for any questions. I think we've caught them most. And whatever we haven't covered, we'll get to. We've still got 20-some workshops to go this week. So I want to give you just a real quick wrap up here so you know what to expect the rest of the week. We're going to have workshops going every day. The next one is today at 2.30 p.m. Julie over at Misty Creek Acres is going to teach you how to build a brooder box for chicks. So you'll be able to actually see step-by-step -step how to set up for brand new chicken babies. Um, and Julie is a local friend of mine, like real life offline friends. And so I'm so tickled that she's teaching some classes this week. You're going to love her. She has a bigger form than I do, more livestock than I do. Um, and so while I may know a lot of gardening, she's going to be a huge resource to all of us this week when it comes to learning about goats and chickens and all the livestock things. Um, so we've got more workshops coming. The Homestead Bundle also launched this morning. I do want to give you a heads up. We've had some website issues. I had to just laugh. Like the thing launched, I think at 6 a.m. And by 8.30 a.m., y'all broke the internet trying to buy it. <laughs> like the whole thing crashed. And I'm like, what is happening? But just hang on, we're fixing it. It's probably already fixed, I'm guessing, because it looks like it was almost, you know, back to normal when we started this live. So. The link for that is in my bio. You can also just send me a message and say, I need the bundle link. Um, the bundle itself is a coll collection of 120 different books and courses and webinars that are all related to homestead living. Um, we contributed that garden course, our brand new, just released today. It's called Grow Food. It's a 260 some page um, guidebook with printables. Plus there are 15 video lessons kind of like this where we just sit and chat and I show you how I do things. And Josh has made some videos, my husband, and he's gonna teach you how to do some things. So you'll be able to um, literally watch those videos as often as you need to, um, to be able to learn to garden. And um, I'm excited, I think it'll be helpful. Um, as far as these workshops, lots of people asking, will you be able to rewatch this later? Yes. So as soon as this ends, I'm going to post this to my page and every workshop this week will work the same way. As soon as the live ends, we're going to post it to the page. And I've asked the other teachers who are hosting to um, add me as a collaborator. So their workshops will also go on my page. So you should be able to just see a whole bunch of really cool content this week if you just go to our main page on Instagram. I'm also going to be sharing a lot of new content as far as just some posts and videos um, with some tips that I think you'll find helpful this year. 
So it's gonna be a fun week, y'all. We're just getting started. I can't even believe, I feel like we've been talking about Homestead Education Week and planning for this um, for so, so long. And I can't believe we're, we're here and it's happening. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Thank you for being my garden friend. Thank you for your support in buying our course. Like you are literally paying my bills and I appreciate it. It allows me to be home and make these videos and be your garden teacher. Um, oh, thank you. Honeycomb Aesthetics bought a badge. Thank you. Um, so anyway, I appreciate you. Stay tuned. More workshops are coming soon and I'll see y'all later. Bye.